I welcome all the participants of this one week online Yan course on social capital and health in India, organized by the Department of Sociology, Aligarh Muslim University, India. I welcome Professor Miwako Hosoda from Saisa University, Japan, foreign faculty of this course. I am Mohammed Akram, Professor at the Department of Sociology, course coordinator and course faculty of this course. This is the fourth day of this one week program. And now we have two lectures scheduled for today. Lecture seven, the topic is Human Development Index, HDI and Public Health. And the second topic is social movements, social capital and health. Both the lectures will be delivered by Professor Miwako Hosoda. Just two, three minutes I would, I would like to take. In this lecture, basically, we'll try to look at the things from social capital perspective. You know, social capital is there in the title of the course. And social capital, the concept of social capital is a very uh, amazing, wonderful concept. We all are aware of the contribution of Bourdieu, Coleman, Putnam, etc. And they have tried to see social capital in multiple contexts. So the concept of social capital is still evolving and it has huge implications in the domain of health and public health. So we, we are very eager to listen to Professor Nivako Hosada on today's program. Uh, Professor Nivako Hosada, are you present here? Yes, thank you very okay. much for the, you know, the, uh, the introduction about the social capital. <laughs> Yeah. So, Professor, over to you, Professor Miwako Hosoda, for the lecture today. Thank you. Uh, so, hello, everybody. Maybe it's good morning in India. Uh, I'm Miwako Hosoda, and uh, I will start the fourth day of my lecture on the social capital and health in India. Actually, I know very few about it. India situation. So I would like to learn from you how the uh, situation in India. So for summary, we already learned about the human and uh, social determinant of health and the basic concept of public health. So today I would like to talk about the human development index and public health. So let me share the screen. So human development index, it was kind of the measure to see uh, the, the human development. <laughs> so it is uh, basically uh, dependent on the statistic composite index. So the, there are three major component, the life expectancy, and education, and that means years of schooling completed and expected years of schooling upon entering the education system. And finally, the per capita income. So this is the figure from the UNDP. And uh, as we previously see, uh, there are three dimensions, long and healthy life, and the knowledge, which is related with education. And it is, and uh, the last one is somehow related with living. And life expectancy, so as we see uh, each kind, the international survey of life expectancy 
and uh, we saw the many countries. The life expectancy is uh, kind of developed and longer. For example, in Japan, uh, 60 years ago, the life expectancy is almost less than 60, like a five, 58 years old. And now they're 83 years old. And India as well, uh, 60 years ago, I heard it's already almost the 40, but now uh, 68. So uh, the human development in, in terms of the life and long and healthy life is improved. And how about marriage? The expected year of schooling and needs year of schooling. So it is also uh, developed. Um, and the last one, the decent standard of living, yeah, is also gradually improved. So this is a human development index report in 2020 to 2002. So, uh, so many uh, European countries and uh, the North American country and uh, the Pacific regions like uh, Japan and Australia and New Zealand uh, very high. And in uh, the, the India, it's kind of a medium range. So that means there are some, still there are some challenge to uh, achieve and also follow the human development in the So human development index, so as you see, it is all related. So if only the life long and the healthy life is achieved, but in the other hand, the decent standard of living is not achieved, uh, it is not um, enough. So, all these are con also they're connected. So we have to uh, see all components. The same thing is said the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. As you see, there are 17 goals of SDGs, but it is not independent each goal all are connected. So this kind of the integrated and the, the total um, scheme could, should be considered. So eventually um, in 2020, we faced a terrible public health challenge. The COVID-19 pandemic has devastated global health infrastructures, widened health inequalities, and exposed health system vulnerability. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has also significantly set back sustainable development goals the goal, that is the goal three, the good health and well-being. So this places, in particular, reduction of maternal mortality, ending all preventable this under five years of age, fighting infectious disease, uh, health coverage, and many more SDG three indicators. Also. Uh, previous progress in reducing inequalities has been 
reversed. So we are now living in a global society with the spread of internet, knowledge and information are also circulating around the world. The infectious disease too. The more globalization has been processing, the more the risk to spread infectious is increased. So health issue need to be resolved on the global scale. This has been reaffirmed by COVID-19, a pandemic, and COVID-19, almost all countries have taken measures to prevent infection by managing the borders, so-called waterfront operation. So however, since we are all global connected, so no country can be safe unless strong healthcare system are established everywhere on the planet. So uh, we, I see the, the, the human index uh, achievement model for globally. So we see some country are very high and some country are low. However, we need to promote every country should be high or very high. Otherwise, for example, the era of the uh, COVID-19 and other infectious disease, it spread all over the world. So now uh, the COVID-19 vaccine was uh, created. And of course, before the vaccine was invented, there are so uh, there are very few options which the people can do to avoid the COVID nineteen, and it is really good thing for us to have the vaccine like this. However, even the vaccine are created, there are some issues occurred. <laughs> the major issue related to vaccine, there are, I can figure out two issues. The first one is fairness and the equality of distribution. And secondary is individual choice and self-determination. What does it mean? But according to the WHO, vaccination is one of the most inexpensive intervention against infectious disease. And it is characterized by the fact that the target population can be set in advance and no lifestyle change are required. However, on the other hand, there are various problems are needed to be considered. The one of them is the fairness and equality of distribution. And the difference. So this is a little bit old one, but uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, vaccination, it is the distribution of a vaccine is something different in each country. So this is the data. A little bit, um, the old data is from 2020 because you know, in, in so this uh, in at that time the distribution and equality is very uh, clear. So some country 
had uh, the high distribution rate of the vaccination and some are very low. So obviously the European countries and North America and Oceania country, uh, the vaccine distribution are very high and African countries and some Asian country are very low. So it reminds the human development index. It is kind of the parallel. So to um, to make the vaccine equality, uh, the WHO and some other health related organization create a COVAX system. The COVAX is the vaccine peer of the access to COVID-19 tools accelerator. So the, this one, the COVID, COVAX is an international framework for high and middle income countries to jointly purchase COVID-19 vaccine and distribute them free to charge to developing countries. So it is kind of the, you know, uh, the mutual support in the countries. And this kind of the coalition can solve this kind of the, uh, the vaccine inequality. This COVAX framework and other measures have improved vaccination coverage worldwide. So it is very important to eliminate the inequality. And second, uh, major issue related with COVID-19 vaccination is individual choice and self-determination. As the COVID-19 vaccine become more available, some government required their people to be vaccinated. Then another problem like this happened. Many of civil groups around the world are opposed to vaccine mandatory and vaccine passport because of many reasons. So for example, in the US and Singapore, vaccination records such as vaccine passport are now uh, previously required to present not only at airport, but also at the restaurant and shopping center and many other places. So it was now currently and uh, this kind of vaccine passport is not necessary in the state. However, in certain times they are required. In this time, the people who cannot be vaccinated for health reasons or who have psychological fear about vaccine may be excluded and discriminated against. They're from the perspective of equality and human rights. So we need to avoid this kind of discrimination and respect the individual choice. The people who avoid vaccination for various reasons, including a concern about adverse reaction, are worried against the backdrop of the nationwide program of vaccine harassment in which people are treated unfairly in the workplace because they have not been vaccinated. Some people are saying that the right not to be vaccinated should be understood. In order to prevent infection, it is important for those around us to deepen our understanding of each individual's situation. 
we do not force people who do not want to be vaccinated to get vaccine. Vaccination is not given without the consent of the person receiving it. So it is unnecessary to force people at work or around them to be vaccinated. But, yeah, of course, uh, this is the uh, human rights and uh, the individual choice. But sometimes, uh, okay, so sometimes uh, the education about the vaccine and um, so if, so clear and transparent explanation is needed. So sometimes vaccine is um, considered about the kind of the poison. So, and not only the COVID-19 vaccine, but uh, polio vaccine or some other vaccine which should be, uh, which are supposed to be vaccinated to the infant or baby, uh, the mother or other adult does not understand the meaning of the vaccine and the children got the disease without uh, vaccinated. So I introduced the word of Dr. Paul Farmer. Paul Farmer is the uh, medical doctor and Harvard researcher, and he contributes the public health in the developing country, such as Haiti and African countries. It is very sad he passed away suddenly last year but he wrote a lot of books and his achievement is so great. And so I just to introduce his word. The optimism is okay. Let's all hope for the best, but that's not preparing. Maybe a little crowd of pessimists would spur us to prepare better for a public health catastrophe. So it is better to have a hope and positive attitude. However, we need to think the negative aspect of the public health to overcome it. So I think it is really true. Uh, this is the picture of the, the operation of COVAX. So there are some, some against opposed to the vaccination. And, and the many government uh, recommend and uh, explain what the vaccine is. And this is the, the poster of the Canada government and they indicated the vaccine myth and the vaccine fact. So there are a lot of myth and rumor about vaccine. Maybe in India, do you have such kind of rumor or myth? Actually in Japan, there are many. <laughs> and first dose and second dose of vaccine, uh, the vaccine rate is almost 80%, but third dose and fourth dose, the vaccine rate is almost 20 or so, very low. So uh, yeah, we should see how it is going. And I really want to know what the situation in India, maybe we can uh, know after the, my lecture at the, the discussion hour. Yeah, so the bottom one, 
the meat, the vaccine can make woman infertile. Yeah, this myth is existed in Japan too. And COVID-19 COVID also uh, affects the many range of the social life. And of course, the shortage of medical and hygiene supply is uh, critical, not only for the patient of uh, COVID-19, COVID, COVID but uh, so the many patient including the young patient with illness and disability. So, like this. And also the family of children with special education need and disability felt they were forgotten in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So this kind, those things are happening. Many people focus on only on COVID-19. And the COVID-19 pandemic has put vulnerable people in an even more vulnerable position, like children and people with disability and illness and education sector as well. And the situation was children with illness and disability kept away from learning needs to be seen as a social program, not an individual program. And to protect the right to education of vulnerable children, more general support than usual is needed. So remember the human index, uh, human development index, the second one is the education. And education for all is the fundamental principle of the whole government. But the children with illness and disability sometimes ignore in that uh, scheme. And under COVID-19 situation, this kind of the forgotten the area is appear and such a uh, vulnerable uh, population uh, is easily to be ignored. However, it is really important in this situation for, to, for us to care and provide uh, adequate service to such kind of uh, population. So that means the public health. So now I talk about the planetary health. Have you ever heard of planetary health? So planet health is so related with human health. So let's see the uh, current situation of environment. We are facing a climate change and its influence. So as I first say, we are living in the age of anthropocene, a time of dramatic expansion of human activity and rapid socioeconomic and environmental change. This pandemic of the COVID-19 in the context raised many questions for us. What kind of relationship between people, society, and nature is appropriate for sustainable society that is resilient against disease and disaster and that can enjoy the benefit of nature? Humans have had a negative impact on the Earth through global warming and ocean acidification causing climate change and the decrease in biodiversity. One clue to solve the problem is the concept of planetary health. 
the planetary health has been expanded globally since 2015, when the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet launched the Rockefeller Foundation Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. Many global challenges can be better understand by engaging the concept of planetary health, I believe. That it provides the critical linkage and causal relationship between human health and environment change. The planetary health emphasizes that the urgent task is to review the relationship among people, society, and nature, and to seek new way of connecting them. So that is um, living together and inclusion. In planetary health, several issues are noted, such as climate change, biodiversity, and soil degradation, and nutrition, and water use. So, so this figure you can easily get through the internet. So please take a look afterward. So I'll talk about uh, the, something related about planetary health in the Japanese context. So Japan previously stand, stands was to pursue only the country economic development. After World War, um, people think and very eager to increase the GDP gross national products. And um, on the other hand, there are some negative impact to the nature and people. So Japanese society has faced many major environment problems such as air and water pollution due to the rapid economic development since the 1960s. So there are so many uh, environmental uh, problems and caused the, uh, the disease like uh, Minamata disease, Yokaichi disease, and Itaitai disease and Niigata Minamata disease. So it was happening in 1960 to 1970s. However, still uh, there are the patients who are suffering from such uh, environmental disease. And even the children of such patient has uh, negative uh, influence from that environmental disease. So this uh, kind of uh, disease uh, herit heritage and very harmful for people. Yeah, the natural environment and the air pollution and water pollution all affect human health soil contamination as well. So it occurs uh, the cancer risk and skin disease and cardiovascular disease. And of course, the other contaminated water and the, and the air, air pollution cause the respiratory illness. So the impact of science and technology on human life has given many adverse events. So we need to consider how to operate sustainable development in the global society. 
and preserving the ecosystem. So I propose coexistence is important. Coexistence of people and nature can be urgent challenge. And we need to consider and realize coexistence of people and nature. And in this uh, the goal, the planetary health takes us. Arigatou gozaimasu. Serious, thank you. Serious look at the human, political, economic, and social system. So I'll show you some example of the sustainable coexistence between people and nature in Japan. So this is the world map. And here is in Japan. This is India. And almost in the middle of uh, Japan, there are the city of Odawara. Odawara in Kanagawa prefecture. And here, uh, the one man yeah, start the solar sharing in Kanagawa and Odawara. His name is uh, Yamato Oyamada. He used to work at the post office, but after uh, the Great East Japan disaster, he decided that nuclear power plant were a bad idea. Uh, we saw the, uh, maybe the first day or second day, um, the damage of the Great East Japan disaster. So it was the terrible disaster, uh, earthquake and tsunami and nuclear power plant accident. Actually, this nuclear power plant accident is not uh, terminated. It's still ongoing process to um, shut down the nuclear, the crippled nuclear power plant. And the, Mr. Oyamada decided that the nuclear power plant was a bad idea. And he wants to create a sustainable society. And he quit his job at the post office and began to work on the promotion of renewable energy and community development. And what he did is uh, he started solar sharing in 2016. So solar sharing um, initiative that combine the power generation and agriculture by cultivating crop under solar panel. You can see the picture of solar sharing. So there are the rice paddy, and top of that, there are the solar power panel. And Mr. Oyamada established Kanagote farm and has been introducing solar sharing. And she sell the both rice and electricity. The electricity generated by solar sharing is purchased by Minna Denduk. This is in the middle. It's kind of an electricity company. It is called Minna Denduk and delivered to consumers who have signed the contract. Actually, I used to, I used to uh, use a Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, uh, which has the uh, a nuclear power plant. However, I switched my uh, electricity source to Minna Denduk. So now I use uh, the electricity from the renewable energy company. How is India? There are some yeah, renewable energy should be maybe uh, developed in some area. And he also, uh, he, he rent the land 
and gradually there's many volunteers gathered. So volunteers came from the, the community and also uh, the university and the high school student come to see the, uh, come to support and help the solar sharing. And the number of people so began to cooperate with Mr. Oyamada. And from 2021, he opened the farmer's cafe called the Siesta. So this cafe, kind of the restaurant, is operated by electricity generated by his own solar sharing. And he want to serve the, the food which was from his land. And it is good circulation of economic and uh, the energy, I think. And even more, he made the Japanese sake, the rice wine, from their rice from the rice paddy and electricity from his solar sharing. So this kind of the solar sharing project has been introduced in the Minister of the Environment as a model right now. So actually I am a friend of Oyamada now uh, when he started this kind of project and see the process. It is not very easy process and he has difficulties to, to borrow the money from the bank. And also some uh, someday uh, because of the typhoon, the solar panel was totally crushed and he need to restore every solar panel. So it was very hard, but he, did not give up and continue to do the, this kind of project. So I'd like to support him. And so um, his project from this uh, the Great Eastern uh, disaster and yeah, I can show an another example. And Miyagi Prefecture, this is uh, located in Tonfoku. And here, uh, the coastline of Miyagi Prefecture was so damaged by tsunami of Great East disaster. Initially, uh, this area, the Miyagi, it is called the Sandiku Rias Coastline. And here is there are the complex coastal terrain due to wave erosion. For this reason, many fish come near and the fishery have become one of the major industry in this area. And also uh, oyster aquaculture is very uh, popular in this area and many fishermen um, do this business. And before, sometimes a red tide happened in this area. The red tide is the phenomena in which phytoplankton living in the water abnormally increased and the color of water changed. And the color of water varies depending on the plankton that cause it and the color is reddish brown or brown. So where the plankton come from? So it come from the, uh, the upstream of the 
how uh, people live in area and factory. And once the red tide come to the oyster culture place, the oyster, the color of oyster turned red and people don't want to buy such a red color oyster. So it is become a huge damage for the fishermen. Okay. And uh, the Mr. Hatakema, he is one of the uh, the far the fisherman who is breeding uh, oyster aquaculture. And he and his colleague came to realize that the sea will never be clean again unless the same sense of value is shared by all the people living along the river. Then he established the society to protect the forest for oyster, to begin his activities to promote the protection of both the forest and the sea. Uh, Mr. Hatakeyama and his colleagues started to plant trees on the mountain to create a forest near the source of the river. Mr. Hatakeyama told that let us create a forest near the source of the river on the mountain. And the poet Tetsuko Kumagaya, who lived near the midstream of the river named the Tree Planted May Movement, Mori wa Umi no Koibito, that is literally uh, the forest is the lover of sea. Since uh, 1989, approximately 30,000 trees have been planted in the mountain. The children who are living along the river have participated in this movement. As of today, over 10,000 children have engaged in planting the tree in the mountain. And Mr. Hatakeyama think, so this is a great opportunity for children to learn the environment. So many researchers and practitioners undertake various environmental survey and advocate for a nature-oriented community building based on the outcome of this survey. So it is good circulation. So Mr. Hatakeyama has this movement to print, plant a tree from uh, the 1989, so it means that's almost uh, 30 years ago. But in 2011, um, the earthquake was occurred and his oyster aquaculture farm uh, destroyed and the factory to uh, make the, uh, the oyster to, for, to sell, it is also uh, destroyed by tsunami. But several years later, after the tsunami, Amazingly, the tremendous number of marine lives are being recovered at the astonishing speed. And Mr. Hatakeyama think that the forest made it possible. So now he, he uh, got a very high quality of oyster from the sea and he enjoys his success business of oyster aquaculture farming. And he has earned a lot of money 
for his business and also the uh, the sea uh, can be rich and the the environment keep clean. So this is win-win solution. So I'll show you another example in Sado. So this is the Toki bird. It is um almost endangered species. And the Japanese Toki was died in 2003. And um some of the Toki bird are come from China and the Toki bird are protected in the zoo and it is um, raised in the conservation center in Japan. So like this. So why Toki was gone? The reason is um, people use chemical fertilizer in the rice paddy. The toki eat the frog and the small insect living in the rice paddy. However, uh, the chemical fertilizer uh, kill the frogs and small insect in the paddy and toki there are nothing to for Toki to eat. So what was happened? The some farmer began a new agriculture process called to harmonize the farming of plants and creature. And farmers reduced the chemical fertilizer in the rice field. As a consequence, frog, small fish, and small animals come back from the rich field. The Toki like to eat these fish and animals. So uh, Toki come back. And it is not only to reduce the chemical fertilizer, but it is a method of farming that produce a habit within the paddy field for creatures living in the area. This type of farming protects and produces animals and plants. This results in the creation of a livable environment and a rich ecosystem for Toki birds. So it is a good example to protect the, the animals and also the rice from this um, farm is good quality without chemical fertilizer. The rice has been harvested in this uh, the rice party is organic and it is called toki rice and also they are sold at a high price and normal price. So farmer is happy because the rice sell high price. And not only that, the rice is very good quality and good for the health. So coexistence of animal and plants attract the people and the consumers. So it is also the win-win solution for the farmers, the customers, and the most importantly, the environment. So this is this is the gross national happiness index in Bhutan. Bhutan is located next to India and they introduced the gross national happiness. And this is so related with the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So I'd like to introduce this GNH. 
This is good governance and the conservation of the environment and sustainable socioeconomic development and preserve and promote the culture. And this is the global uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. So maybe you may know. So human health, human development index is so related with this one. So not only human, but also ecosystem and environment are should be uh, considered. And in that case, the concept of planetary health is important. So to achieve the SDG 17 goals and human uh, development index, the so interdisciplinary and international collaboration is crucial. And social capital as well, the relationship with uh, the people and uh, not only people, animal and natural environment, all are connected, so uh, we just to, to share the idea and um, the knowledge to solve the problems in the world. So thank you very much for your attention. This is my uh, seventh lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Miwako Hosoda, for presenting a very beautiful lecture, uh, taking into consideration the public health issues and challenges in Japan and which are applicable to the rest of the world, because Japan is definitely a model of human development. So the title that we had for today's presentation was Human Development Index and Public Health and using this uh, course title, basically you have covered or tried to cover the very important issues and concerns for the humanity, planet, and some of the very beautiful things that you explained today, uh, planetary health. Basically, we are talking about the health of the planet simultaneously, because that is at the core of the uh, model of the sustainable development sustainable health or the sustainability. So thank you very much for very elaborately explaining the topics. Uh, if you want to take uh, a two minute to five minute break, then of course uh, you need to take because uh, you continue to speak for one hour. So please take a break of five minutes and then I'll talk to the participant and then you can join back for the second lecture. And that will be a wonderful one. Thank you very much. So I'll see you in five minutes. Please. So uh, I would like to make use of these four or five minutes. Basically, the, the concept of public health is a very huge one. And it, it's also a very relative one. When we talk about public health concerns in US or UK or Japan or in India, or for that matter, any of the Latin American countries or South African countries, then the concerns would be different. Uh, what do we understand by public health primarily, the conceptual level? If I try to address this issue, then it will not be possible for me to explain this topic in two, three minutes. Public health deals with basically all health related issues which have direct or indirect impact on the health of the people and which prevail at the societal level. This is how you can understand public health. All those factors, determinants with, which influence the health of people directly or indirectly at the societal level is broadly identified as public health. We have seen public health movement in US, in UK, and yes, India is also 
witnessing a kind of transformation, a transition in terms of uh, implications of the public health determinants. But perhaps we have not reached to a stage where we can compare ourselves to the developed part of the world. Professor Miwako talked about COVID because, you know, COVID was a catastrophic situation for the developed part of the world. Of course, it was also a catastrophic situation for the uh, developing part of the world, but we have been witnessing some or the other health issue in this part of the world. But for the Western world, it was, it was something very surprising. And that is why she talked about it. It was a major public health concern in UK. The, the public health movement started in 1850s to deal with the problems caused by cholera, right? So if you look at the things in India, we have several determinants or factors and we have to begin with the core component, the more basic, the most basic rather, that is the safe drinking water. Because in India, the availability of portable water or safe drinking water in itself is a big crisis in many states. And we all know that most of the mortalities at the under five level or the infant level caused because of some of those diseases, we have water bond like diarrhea, right? So the journey towards ensuring public health for all in India will certainly have to begin by ensuring safe drinking water to all. That's a huge difference in the concern of the developed part of the world and the developing countries like India. We all are aware of the, the state of or the condition of availability of safe drinking water. Then the second important concern for us is basically food and nutrition. Unfortunately, we are yet to come out from the requirements of ensuring availability of food to the entire country or the citizens of the country. Because in the global hunger index, we have seen that, that we are performing very poorly. That means in India, still in several states and several specific areas, there are people who have hunger as the core factor of their health or hunger as a major concern of public health. And along with that comes the major issue of nutrition. So when we talk about public health in Indian context, we have to begin with the basics like ensuring portable water that is safe drinking water, then ensuring food, and then ensuring nutrition. The NFHS National Family Health Survey figures four and five still indicate that, that the prevalence of anemia is a huge consideration, is a huge challenge, right? And then comes sanitation. We are yet to have a proper well-developed sanitation system or a garbage disposable system, right? So the public health concerns in Indian context are definitely much more than the public health concerns of the developed countries of the world. So when we listen to those lectures, we need to take into consideration what are the concerns in India and basically in most of the states of India. So these are some of the issues that I wanted to share with you. I thought that that this is a good time for me to share these things. Uh, I can see Professor Miwako is back. So uh, I welcome her again, and we are going to start the uh, next lecture. And that is definitely very interesting. The topic for the next lecture is social movements, social capital, and health. So uh, please enjoy the lecture of Professor Miwako Hosada and keep your questions. Uh, ready during the tutorials. We'll try to address. Uh, I don't know if Professor Miwako will be available or not because officially in the program, 
as per the programs will not be available but if you can manage to stay some time find some time to answer some of the queries then that will be a welcome situation right so over to professor mirako so that for the second lecture thank you thank you very much Ah, yes, so I, I will attend uh, the program soaring session as well today. <laughs> so now uh, it's amazing, it is the last lecture. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so I will talk about social movement and social capital and health as a last uh, lecture. So I will share the slide again. This is not the one. So, a social movement, so in the sociology, the social movement and the people um, protest is one of the big theme of uh, the research and survey. And we can see the social movement, uh, the seeds of the people's voice. And uh, the people who are motivating in the social movement propose the alternative way of uh, thinking and the way of the system or the social the phenomena in the society so to grasp the the you know, such a tendency it is really important to consider the current society And in the social movement, there are the, something to relate with health. It is called health social movement. So this concept is proposed by the Brown and the Vestifiki from the Brown University. The, Component of the health social movement is the movement that demand access to healthcare services. The second one is a movement to address health inequalities and inequalities based on race, ethnicity, gender, class, and sexual orientation. The third one is uh, the embodied health movement. So this one is a movement that seeks a better way for people living with illness or disability to live with their illness or disability based on their own experience. So um, Brown and the Vastuki um, show the three dim dimension of the social movement, but each of them um, I think we already overviewed the stage of the stage and the aspect of health. And please consider in the in your country which type of movement you can see or which type of uh, the movement is needed to change the current situation. Uh, this is the picture of the, the ceremony to sign the Americans with Disability Act of 1990. So it is called ADA and ADA is a federal law and it ADA requires us that persons with disabilities be full participation in US society. And this act was led by 
the people with disability and illness. Behind the this ceremony, there are so many people with disability uh, made a uh, uh, the demonstration and sometimes they went to the uh, the capital in the Washington DC to appeal their uh, diversity the situation. So this is the explanation of ADA. It prohibits private employers and states and local government from discrimination on the basis of the disability in hiring, hearing, promoting, and the compensation employees. And they prohibit discrimination in programs, activities, and services provided in public facilities. And provide prohibit discrimination against persons with disability in private entry place of business in public accommodation like uh, banks, restaurants, and supermarket, etc. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce again the, the example of the social movement of the people with brain injury in the U.S. I studied uh, in U.S. from 2004 to 2012, and during that time, I have uh, uh, the connection with the people with disability and uh, the association and patient groups in New York and Boston area. And Brain Injury Association Massachusetts is one of them. And Brain Injury Massachusetts, uh, it forced the class action lawsuit for independent living in 2007. The BIAMA this association and the five parties filed a lawsuit against the state governor and officials for not taking measures to allow people with brain injuries to live in the community. At that time, um, many of the people with uh, brain injury, they they, they only have a, uh, the choice to stay uh, institutional care, like in, in the nursing home. However, uh, nursing home, there are many you know, elderly, basically nursing home for, is for elderly, and the young patient with brain injury it's so isolated, feel isolated, and they does not make a friend in the facility. So they want to live in the community. It is called independent living. And the BIAMA and five parties says the current situation violate the Americans with Disability Act and the Medicaid Act. So remember the American with Disability Act in 1990. It ensured the person with disability be full participation in US society. However, in Massachusetts in 2007, uh, the people with disability are not allowed to participate in the community, but uh, keep staying in the nursing home. So uh, the BIMA and five parties said the current situation violates 
the American with Disability Act. And also Medicaid Act, it is kind of the same regulation. It um, prohibits the discrimination of the people with disability and illness. Uh, the person who actually started um, this movement is Miss Catherine Hutchinson. She is a woman who suffered a stroke and left her totally paralyzed. Her left hand and the left body and the left leg. Her left side is paralyzed. And she operates a uh, motorized wheelchair with slight movement of her head and use the dial and the computer to communicate with others by using her eyes to indicate what he say he wants she wants to say. So it, she used digital technology and welfare device, social welfare device nicely. And she has been living in a nursing home for nine years since the onset of her stroke. And she said, sometimes I feel like a prisoner a cause of a crime. I have no right to be accused of. And also she said, I'm sorry, she, this is she. She said, and I needed to start my own life, not just be tied to a wheelchair here. So she said, you know, her current situation is just like a prisoner. She doesn't have any um, free choice. So she thinks like this. And she is thinking independent living in the community, not in a nursing home. And she and four other parties along with the Massachusetts it's Brain Injury Association, Brain Injury Massachusetts, have filed a class action lawsuit in U.S. District Court against Governor Deval Patrick and various related officials. Actually, uh, the Governor Deval Patrick is known as a uh, very supportive for the social welfare. That's why and the uh, BIAMA and five parties take law suite under his administration because he's very understandable for the people with disability. Uh, this is from my interview of the representative of BIAMA. And there the judgment. In June 2nd, 2008, settlement, Reached. The budget will be allocated to allow 2,000 US dollars of the approximately uh, 8,000 living in the facility to live in the community. Ah, I'm sorry, it is a number of the patient. Uh, so yes, so 2,000 patients you know, with uh, the disability can have the benefit of living in the community. And this $169,000 uh, provided each person. And the total budget is uh, well, 15 million at this end per person per year. And so how is the, the life there change uh, thanks to this uh, lawsuit? I would like to introduce the one young man named Raymond. He had severe brain injury in 2008 and he spent about two years in the nursing home. But in 2010, as a result of the class action lawsuit, he began to live independently in the community. And 
enjoy his life. And he's volunteering at the hospital and he enjoy his life. So this is a picture of himself and the person next to him is his mother. So social movement changed the life of the person with um, disability in this case. And there are so many uh, social movement and the people's advocacy. For example, uh, in Japan, there are several patient groups to advocate their right and their and to, to promote the scientific research on their own uh, disability or illness. And this is the kind of the summary of the needs to raise awareness of and supportive to uh, realize the supportive society. And for healthcare providers, uh, recognize the patient with, with cancer or other disease and the people's living and pay for patient free from social stigma and self-stigma. The families as well, free from stigma. And workplace and school create an environment where the patient can easily access. And survivors of a patient can Need, you know, continue to work or study in that place. Yeah. To the other society, learn about the reality of the survivors, not only cancer, but the stroke survivors, cancer survivors, or and neuro, neurological disease. Same. The people to know the reality of the patient. So this is a place where the cancer patient stay and uh, talk about their emotional uh, feeling and some kind of the consultation. But this is out of hospital. It is called Maggie's Tokyo. And uh, Maggie Jenkins, who is an English woman who studied uh, this kind of place, when she got cancer, he, she had nowhere to express her own feeling. So she created the place where she can express their, her own feeling. And there are many people support this idea, and now there are more than 20 Maggie's house, Maggie's house like this in the world. Uh, this is another social movement to get rid of the cancer metaphor, and uh, they try to make a corrective impact free from stigma. So as I so see the second day, maybe and yesterday, the cancer has a social stigma and discrimination. I heard in India there are not so many stigma against cancer. However, in Japan they are still they are existed. So people make some you know, collective action and make a um, social movement to reduce the stigma. And patient 
mutual support is also very important. It is called peer support. Hello. Yes. <laughs> okay. So when people with the same illness and disability share the interact with each other, but the experience, they gain a sense of security and self-affirmation that cannot be obtained through professional support. And it is now getting um, attractive, not only in Japan, but in US and the UK and many European countries. And people with illness and disease, they can use their own life experience to connect with the people and help them by giving them a sense of hope and well being. And also, they can support people to gain a sense of control over their lives. Yeah, it is called patient wisdom. And also they can help people engage with built connection and feel a sense of belonging to their local community. So it is somehow related with social capital. And then they can enable people to gain satisfaction in different parts of their lives. So in all aspects, the peer support is very important. And I said the peer support is the people with the same illness or disability. However, everybody can be a peer, even the medical professionals or family or the mom or anyway, anybody, literally, uh, as long as they are standing on the same stage of the patient. And remember, uh, the WHO defined the, what is health. The health is not uh, physical damage, but the mental and psychological and social aspect. And recently, uh, the loneliness and isolation is one of the huge uh, health issues. And loneliness damage people's health. Accord it is the data shows like the and the people in isolated feeling isolated and the loneliness they uh, they don't have any connection with the community and they don't have the social capital The social capital and the social support affect health. It is recently very, very known. So this is this chart include a number of social determinants of uh, the heart disease, education, income, and health behavior like uh, smoking, alcohol intake, physical activities, and eating habit. It's all related. And education, income, and age do not directly cause the heart disease. However, they affect a number of other factors in a causal chain that does lead 
could the disease. For example, a samurai with greater education is less likely to smoke or consume alcohol because education is not the direct cause of the disease, but it is said to be further upstream of distress. Maybe you will find uh, the connection with uh, uh, age, education, and income, and disease. So, of course, there are many reasons, and there are some the people's uh, the characteristic and uh, the heredity, and to something uh, cannot be changed by individual's own effort. However, uh, the education and income uh, so related with the outcome of health. So high education uh, caused the uh, gain the uh, physical activities and it the high education avoid the fat intake and also the you know alcohol consumption and smoking that means a low education uh, cause the fat intake and alcohol and smoking and as I said, the high income uh, people uh, has much physical activities than the low income people. And all this kind of the uh, lifestyle caused the pre disease condition like type D diabetes, the cholesterol, high cholesterol or low cholesterol or blood pressures. And finally, uh, it caused the uh, severe and critical illness. So remember the social determinant of health, the rainbow model of health. So something like uh, age and uh, the gene, we cannot change. However, the lifestyle and the working space and living place, we see somehow the factor we can change. And social capital is also affected here. And so let's see the definition of social capital. It is a resource that can be accessed through membership in network and other social structures. So it is a relationship of people and the network. So what is the difference from social networks? So it, the difference is level of analysis and the characteristic of group communities as opposed to an individual characteristic. So the phenomena seems uh, similar. However, the level of analysis is different. The concept of social capital get popular through the, the book, which was written by Robert Putnam, The Boring Alone. So in this book, he indicates the social capital is declining in America, according America. So his point is, before, when people go to the boring place, 
So there are some uh, Kamala who are playing bowling, and the one can easily join that group. However, recently, uh, even if the person go to bowling play, they play by themselves. Uh, even there are some people they don't do, not you know say let's do it and uh, enjoy it together, but he just play bowling, and uh, the electric score is appeared and just and he just tried to uh, get a high score so uh, people can enjoy boring alone so this is uh, somehow uh, the robot partner find um, somehow uh, the, the social capital that the human relationship is uh, declined And again, I say the definition of social capital. This is a resource that can be accessed through membership in network and other social structure. So what is the resource? So ability of community to undertake collective action. The second one is ability of community to exercise informal social control. The number three is ability of community to transmit norms. So let's see the mechanism is linking the social capital to health outcomes. For example, mobilizing to protest the closure of emergency service, passage of local smoke fee ordinance. So remember the, the definition of the Brown and the Zbunanewski of social movement, health social movement. So the collective action to protest the to protest the limitation of access of hospital is important and also the smoke-free regulation to, to demand the smoke-free regulation is one of the um, social movement related with health. And doing this kind of the, uh, the corrective action makes the social regulation change and to in in this case to protect the health. So for example, in some area, uh, people are prohibited to smoke on the street or on the in the restaurant and on the you know the regular road or the station. And the outcome is obviously is supportive for protecting health. And yes, the role of a community adult is preventing drugs abuse among underage children. It was also that it is said also informal social control. So, for example, what do you do when the children smoke in the park or the teenager use a drug in the high school or university? What do you do? If they are the social capital, well, they you say stop it. It's not good to your health. So this kind of you know attitude and behavior is informal social control. You are not forced to say that, but you are spontaneously to do so because for the good. 
So this is this kind of you know this attitude and behavior is somehow linking social capital and cause a good health outcome. And this is another linking social capital to health outcome. It's a diffusion of norms via social network. And not every instance is health promoting. Yeah, sometimes you know, social capital and human network has a negative consequence like uh, cyber bullying, like uh, Facebook or SNS, social network service. And also, there are interesting consequences of social capital and health. So this is the research of the Nicholas Christakis. He's a Harvard scholar. But now he's working at the Yale, Uni Yale University. And he used a uh, 32 years follow-up study of Framingham Heart Study of spring cohort. Uh, actually, when I it was Framingham is located in Massachusetts, and when I was uh, living in Boston, I visited the headquarters of Framingham Heart Study, and it was very amazing experience. But yeah, if I have a chance, I will tell you about this. But now, so let's see the this um, research. And anyway, so in Framingham, there are so long lifelong uh, the cohort. And there are 30, 38,000 more people uh, participate. And what he, he, he found is the modeling speed, speed the spread of obesity. Obesity is eating a lot. <laughs> and this is the consequence. Each circle represents one person in, in, the, in, the, in this data. And the 2,200 person are here and make social networks. And the circle with red border denote women. And the circle with blue border denote men. The size of each circle is proportional to the person body mass index. Your uh, so-called BMI, body mass index, you know. The interior donor color, the interior color of the circle indicates the person's obesity status. The yellow donut uh, obese person. The body mass index is 30, that is a kind of the fat person. And the green donuts are non obese person, not fat, the healthy, kind of healthy that is green. The color of tie between the node indicates the relationship between them. The purple donut are friendship or marital tie and orange donut is family tie. Yeah, so friendship is purple and orange is family. So what is discovered from this uh, research? So you can see um, the, the, the obesity person and uh, the, the, the many a number of obesity person is 
located in one uh, area. And the people who are not obesity also create the one uh, group. So that shows the obesity is not the independent phenomena. But if your friend is uh, the obese status, it is easy for his friend, his or he or she friend, become obese. And if the person is not obese status, their friends also stay non obese status. So um, the this uh, article said the this uh, article's title is the spread of obese in large social network, and the Nicholas Kritaki said obese is um, kind of the infectious disease. Of course, obesity is not an infectious disease, but it's, it's spread out like an um, infectious disease. So this uh, research is very famous and it show it is introduced the New York Times, the big um, newspaper for in the States. So let me uh, introduce the downside of social capital. Usually social capital is considered as a favorable and good social phenomena. However, there is a downside. For example, on the exchange of favors, turns excessive obligation on network members. And uh, social cohesion turns intolerant of diversity. And informal social control means pressure to conform. And the diffusion of innovation means trans innovation can be health damaging. So uh, we have to be very careful the negative side of social capital, negative consequence of social capital. The social capital itself is a neutral uh, concept. So the consequence, we should be careful for the consequence of the social capital. And the social capital is con considered as the collective efficacy and the community organizing and informal control and social interaction in street. And they deduce perception of crime. As we see the, you know, the tobacco and and also there are the social support uh, doing work, uh, checking on neighbors and exchange of resources. And this, the community level effort, visual level effort, we can overcome some uh, the, the social crisis or some uh, negative phenomena. So can we evaluate the bird social capital? So there are some evidence in Japan. It is Taketoyo town. And like a Framingham Hat study, this Taketoyo town uh, has 
uh, good uh, survey cohort in the community. And they have the population strategy to open the community senior center called Salon <laughs> and managed by volunteer. And the program are supported by the municipality through providing a public benefits. And not to be isolated and feel loneliness. So this is what the, also the uh, the consequence of uh, intervention of social capital and final outcome. Of course, final outcome is the healthy aging without feeling loneliness and isolation. So to achieve this, many factors are required, like a physical and psychological support and uh, the collaboration of the community and facility facilitate uh, some place to do like a venue and the and also the volunteer and the individuals. So this kind of the multidisciplinary and um, multi-generation collaboration the healthy aging and the protective community and which is uh, people feel secure to live in is realized. And also uh, the urban planning and the the community design is also affect the social capital and uh, avoid to and elimination of loneliness. So this is one of the example uh, so to avoid the loneliness. So the city design could be open and um, very acceptable for the every people without any uh, the barrier for uh, building and the, the transportation. So people, even people with disability and illness it is easy to move in the city and to transport um, smoothly. The social prescribing also are now paying attention. So like a loneliness or, or isolated feeling, it is not, uh, disease. However, sometimes people feel anxiety and loneliness and it causes uh, physical um, damage and also uh, sometimes people go to the visit uh, medical facility. They, for example, they cannot sleep well or uh, feel bad 
or have a back pain or shoulder pain. And something like that is not uh, cured by medical doctor. So in UK, they implement the system of the social prescribing. So that is uh, uh, the kind of the, not the prescription to give the, you know, the drug and the treatment. However, it solves such kind of patient problem by using a community resource. So, right. Um, the doctor noticed that the patient needs social prescribing. The doctor asked the link worker uh, to introduce the patient the community resource. And the link worker introduced the patient the learning and the skill as some opportunity to learn and get uh, the new skill or the community empowerment support or activities like uh, drawing or reading books or um, physical exercise like uh, yoga or something. So it is really, um, I think, a nice system. <laughs> And so now, so I would like to invite the health research. So as we see, health research is a many dimension and also the as many aspect, like we see the planetary health, the environmental research also includes the health research. So there are some opportunity to study the healthcare ecosystem or patient centricity. Uh, wow, well, what's something happened? Bioinformatics and science technology studies. So there are many opportunities. Could you please erase this line? I don't know somebody what it. Anyway, it's almost as finish uh, the end of my lecture. So it's all related. And I just to introduce the International Social Association. Again, it will be held in June, right? This year is come. <laughs> and also, we have the Asia Pacific Sociological Association following the end conference next in, not in India, but in Indonesia. So, of course, you are very welcome to participate in that conference. So, thank you very much for your attention. Still, this, this line are uh, not erased, but you can see the beautiful environment in Japan, the rice party and the aquaculture and Mount Fuji. So if you have a chance, please visit us. And we also trying to protect this nature as well as our health. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and also you had I'm very hoping you to protect your land, your environment and people's health in India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Miwako Hosuda for a wonderful lecture. This was very insightful and uh, definitely the way you have connected social movements with social capital, this, is, this has provided enough food for thought. I'm sure the participants got benefited by this lecture and the way the, the theoretical connection or the discourses, how these discourses are interconnected with each other, the way you explored all these things. 
I would like to thank you. And then I would like to add here two, three sentences for the students uh, who are basically associated with sociology here, that the concept of social capital, uh, basically, Bourdieu talked about it. And then Coleman also talked about it in a different context. And then Putnam basically created altogether a new discourse on that. Now, the students or the participants who are not belonging to sociology, they may wonder what the social capital is all about. Is this just about the networking kind of thing? Just for their understanding, I would like to say that Bodhio talked about an alternative form of economic capital. He stated that it is not just the economic capital which is playing crucial role. Along with it, there are other forms of capital like social capital is there, cultural capital is also there. And Buddha tried to solve social capital in terms of the, the social networks, basically, which are existing. But in Bodhya's perspective, basically, it was a feature of the elites kind of thing. Right? And then Coleman basically put forward a thesis that it is not confined only among the rich, even the marginalized, deprived, or vulnerable people have social capital because it ascends, it grows. It's not that that you have to put money to develop it. It grows because the relationship keep growing, the networks keep growing. So no matter whether you belong to a privileged class or an underprivileged class, but the social capital will be there. But Putnam, as it was uh, beautifully explained by Professor Miwako, Putnam saw social capital in terms of a feature of the community or the organization. As he stated that, that social capital in American society is declining. That means we need to look at it in terms of the social structure, the social organization, because the kind of trust that we are looking for, that is basically there in the larger organization or the social system. Now, if we apply these concepts in Indian context, and especially in the context of public health, then this is, this is having basically a massive application here because public health is a shared space. Sanitation is a shared space, right? Now in India, when we have some sort of practice of inequality, stratification, hierarchy, that means this social capital is at discount, right? So that is why there is an underutilization of the public health facilities. When you have the public toilets, there is an underutilization of the public toilets, right? So there are several specific things which are related to the public health. For example, water, the safe drinking water. In India, we had witnessed some kind of the practice of pollution and purity. And that is why certain peoples were deprived from making use of those uh, public goods. So the public goods were not operating like public goods. When, when we look at the things from that perspective, then the notion of social capital becomes very important because we cannot think of having a massive public health infrastructure and a maximum utilization of public health facilities unless we build up the trust component, unless we build up that kind of the, the, the reciprocity kind of environment. So that is why we talked about a social capital in the context of health. And then uh, social movement is definitely playing a very important role because if these factors are missing, then those things will not reappear on, its, on their own. Somehow we need to make a reclaim on that. It was as it was beautifully pointed out by Professor Miwako also by citing the example of the brain injury cases, right? So some how this space needs to be reclaimed if we start thinking in terms and whatever the target of health for all is existing in the policy documents, we can make it practically uh, successful maybe in the time to come. So with these notes, I would like to conclude this session. Uh, very insightful. Thank you very much, participants, for your presence hearing. We can see that we are we were having the maximum number of participants in today's lecture. So it's time to close the lecture, but I want to say a formal 
Thank you to Professor Miwako Hosada for remaining connected for, first of all, for giving consent to join this program as a foreign faculty. We submitted this proposal to Gyan office way back in 2019. And after that, basically this COVID phenomenon came. And at one point of time, we were thinking that we don't know what may happen. And it was having such a catastrophic impact basically world over. But thanks to almighty God also that we remain safe. He protected us during this catastrophic situation. And then something that we planned way back at the end of 2019 could become successful in 2023. So thank you for your presence, for your uh, continuous uh, in engagement and then we uh, I used to communicate all the formal communications in some or the other form with you and as of today I think the participants coming from different parts of the country are getting largely benefited by you and as you very rightly pointed out about the International Sociological Association and the Asia Pacific Sociological Association yes these are the larger platforms and I'm delighted to say here that these are the platforms where you can build up your own social capital, right? Exactly. So these are, <laughs> these are yeah, I totally agree with you. Thank you very much for inviting me to do such a wonderful opportunity. I'm very much uh, yeah, yeah, pleased to yeah, stay here and give a lecture to you. And uh, yeah, maybe next time I wish I could visit your university and see you yeah. all in person. <laughs> yeah, we, we would be looking forward to see you here in person. Initially, it was planned to have you in person, but this online phenomenon occurred in between. But thank you very much for being with us. Right? Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you very much, participants. We will close the meeting now for the uh, con conversion of the recordings. And then we will meet again after 30 minutes uh, at 12.40. At 12.40, we will meet again. And if Professor Mimako is finding some time, she may join again, right, to respond to the queries maybe raised to her. Thank you. See you later.